We got two games to talk about. The World Series has started, and we are split at a game apiece between the Rangers and the Diamondbacks. So they go to the desert tonight. Jack, Aram, happy Halloween Eve. Aram getting spooky in Old Town Scottsdale. Took uh, Cohen to dinner. Took Will Cohen uh, out to dinner on Saturday. You guys are out there covering the Fall League, which is probably fantastic. Yeah, I I, <laughs> I got some replies uh, yesterday. Uh, during the World Series game about how psychotic I am for tweeting videos of prospects during uh, the World Series. But we were watching both. We were we were on top of both. But, you know, look, there, someone's got to do it, right? Someone's got to be out here watching these prospects play. And it's an honor to be out here. We are going to try to get to the World Series. I think one of these games, I at least get in the area, you know, do some stuff. I'm I'm shooting for Wednesday. We're we're working on it. We'll okay. we'll keep you posted. But the goal is to get out there Wednesday, and that could be a lot of fun. Arizona's awesome, man. The Fall League is a special place. We've talked about that. But now being here with the World Series going on, which you know we booked this months ago, had no idea. Uh, it's awesome having Will here because the video side of things, man, like it's been awesome just being able to get, you know, open side looks. Will's like the extraordinaire. So we're going to have a lot of great content on the call up from being out here, but we might have some cool world series stuff too coming right up. I love it. Um, that is kind of like the weird work in sports thing that I think that a lot of, at least my friends don't necessarily understand what I, when I talk to them that don't work in sports, it's, Oh, how are you tweeting about AFL stuff when the World Series is going on? And I don't like the cliche office for the night because it's like overused by everybody. But it is your office for the night. Like you were working at the Arizona Fall League that night. You weren't, you know, you weren't really on the clock for the World Series stuff. No, no. And and I'm excited. Now I'm on the clock for the World Series stuff. And, you know, I, I went back just in case there were some things I missed. And there was definitely some like sequences and stuff that I missed that I'm excited to talk about. I tweeted out a Merrill Kelly sequence that was insane. Yeah. Um, but, you know, felt like I was tuned into the big stuff, went back, watched pretty much every single pitch, like quickly through it. And, uh, oh, man, I'm excited to talk about that ball game because that was, I think, the score obviously doesn't indicate what it was, but it. I just think it went almost in no way that anybody could have possibly expected it to go. Yeah. Um, And and there's a very real scenario where, you know, one small little difference, right? One pitch and the D-backs could be up to zip right now. I think there's a play that honestly could have the Rangers up to zip right now. That that's how I know it's a good series though. Right. Yes. You can go both ways with that. And of course it, it is what it is, but that's a great like devil's advocate counterpoint. It's like, That's when you know it's a good series. We could highlight maybe two to three plays that could make it two zip either way, which is awesome. And we've settled at one one, which is, you know, a fun spot to be. We're also going to talk about some overreactions that I have for you. I Mm -hmm. have like three or four things that statements that they might not be overreactions. So I want your thoughts. Um, I don't necessarily believe all of these things, but I think they are reasonable or within reaching distance of reasonable. Yeah. To, to feel. Um, so then I want you to say like, you know, which it is and where it kind of lines up on the uh, scale of overreaction or not. Yes. Gabby Moreno is the best catcher in baseball. That's not an overreaction. Um, no, 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 no. He's the go. It, it's all brought to you by BetMGM. We got two games to talk about. So we are going to do a quick rehash of game one. It's so far in the review though. So, you know, we're going to highlight the highlights and then we're going to dive a little bit more into game two. We'll preview game three after we do those overreactions or not. Let's start with game one. That was a 6-5 Texas win in 11. Obviously, Adolis Garcia had the blow, the Apo Taco in the 11th to give the Rangers the win. The thing that jumped out to me, kind of working backwards, Adolis with the homer, yes. Leclerc working through the 10th and 11th for Texas. Awesome. Nails. Corey Seager's release of emotion after he hit that homer in the ninth inning was something you don't get from Corey Seager. Let's make that abundantly clear. There are other guys that may scream in the fourth inning when they homer in a four run game. It takes that moment on that stage in that game for Corey Seager to release that cry after he dials up a baseball. And I, I was watching it on mute and I was like, damn, I want the, I want the volume on right now. That was amazing from him and i love that he released that emotion 
I, for, I forgot that we had to talk about game one too. We, we yeah. haven't gotten to that one yet. Cause that was, that was on Friday. Was Friday. So yeah. Awesome. Because that was one of the best baseball games I've watched in a long time. I actually watched that Peter came over. We watched that and just like, we looked at each other, I think five different times during that game. And we we're just like, Holy crap. What else could you want from a baseball game? Like it was, it was everything you could have wanted, but on the Seager point, we've seen him do that one other time. And it was a huge playoff home run for the Dodgers. So I mean, it, it's really awesome when you see players that don't normally give emotion or show that much emotion, just lose it because it just makes you, it just shows you how important it is. And that's it, fans. All you want to see is just like how much these guys care about it. And yeah. it's just so awesome to see that from a Seager, but also in the spot, right? I mean, people can talk about the pitch and right. It was a two run shot in, in the bottom of the ninth to tie it. And Paul Seawald is a guy that throws is the lowest release point, I think, on a four-seamer in the sport, if I'm not mistaken. And it it kills hitters at the top of the zone because it's got yeah. great carry, and that's how he's made his living, and that's how he's been unhittable this year. It's that in a breaking ball, and that's all he throws. Yeah. And look, they use some other arms in their bullpen already, and also you're going to go with your best against their best. Even if Corey Seager is a guy who crushes vert, which we know, you're still going to go with your best against their best. What, are you going to go to the South rank there? Like you got to go with your closer and it wasn't a bad pitch. Could it have been a ball or two higher? Maybe, but what do you want him to do? Go out there and throw sinkers. Like that's not what he does. So it it just is what it is. Corey Seager put a good swing on it and uh, an insane swing on it. And they won the game. I don't, I don't think you can say it was a bad pitch. Uh, I don't think you can say that they shouldn't have gotten to Seawald there. Like it's, it's what it is, right? It's your best versus their best. And you know, their best one in that instance, but that was a special swing from Seager on that fastball at the top of the zone. That yeah. is a pitch from Seawald that does not get hit very often. No. And I mean, Seager, he's been that guy all series or sorry, all postseason. And I mean, he did it again there where he didn't have a hit. He got on base twice with two walks, but that was the big hit at that spot. And, and that was all they needed. Yeah. So in a vacuum, obviously that is, Hey, that pitch, Seawald, you know, he's he's an IVB guy and and Seeger, or like, you know, he's a top of the zone heater guy, and Seeger can hit top of the zone heaters. So, like, it's not the most fortunate matchup for Arizona. But um, I love the Ryan Russillo show. Um, and he had one of his guys on Matt Bushman was um on the Blue Jays staff, and they I think this was the Friday episode. And Matt, you know, said a cliche that I guess I hadn't thought about in a while. And he said, fans show up to see the best guys do the hard things. And that was like the best guy doing the hard thing. You know, yes, it's a good matchup for Seager, but Paul Seawald was untouchable this fall. Like Seawald has been so good in October Absolutely go with the best guy and Seager got the best of them. There is no type of pitch that can get past Adolis Garcia right now. And I jotted down Adolis may be lucky that the CS went seven. Cause if this guy sat for like four days, he might've lost this magic. He might've lost this spark. This spark is unfreaking believable. And the fact that they only needed to sit idle for what, two nights before the world series is so ridiculously awesome. And yeah. he's going to keep this shit going like through the final buzzer. When yeah. someone hoists the trophy, that's when he'll cool off. I feel like. And, and one quick thing on, on Seager, by the way, too, yeah. like you throw a, a, a breaking ball instead. Right? I mean, Corey Seager hit 380 against right-handed breaking balls this year. Yeah, so like, right-handed sliders. And, and that's what Seawald throws. So I like, again, you just pick your poison. He's just too good. Uh, Adolis, same, same thing right now. Like, I think the thing with Adolis though, is if you execute your, your game plan, you can maybe limit him a little bit, but the problem is right now, if you miss by a couple inches, if you leave one over the middle, you know, most of the time guys just foul it off or they hit it for a double or whatever, any pitch that is just remotely you know, in his wheelhouse or just remotely a mistake, he's not just hitting, he's hitting it a million feet for a home run or just smashing it 110 miles an hour. So it's just amazing to see this guy not miss a mistake. And the thing with him too, that stands out, I think that 0 for four 
game, you know, against the Astros where he's 0 for 4 with 4 Ks and then he hits that huge home run, his confidence is is unwavering at this point. And, and maybe it always has been that way, but we're really seeing it on this stage where like it doesn't matter how poorly the game's going for him. He still knows he's locked in overall and he's going to get some good swings off at some point in the ball game. And that's why I feel really confident in him pretty much every single game. But after that one, he's pretty much been money every single time, right? It ha- there haven't even been that many, like, Oh, he's over three with three K's and then salvages it in the back end. That was really it. And since then he's just continued to pile together hits three hits on Friday. Of course that walk off home run. And it, it just felt like, of course, He's going to hit a home run there. It almost felt so obvious that I was like, okay, no way. (laughs) It's just like, he can't do it. And it was in another insane swing to hit that ball the other way. uh, Have it get out that fast. He is so strong, but the way he's getting to the ball right now too. And not to mention he had got hit on the hand just before Mm -hmm. that. And that, that, that's the whole anomaly of Adolis that blows my mind too. This guy had a, a patellar strain that we thought it was going to be a season ending injury. Like he was in a lot of pain there. It was a really awkward landing. He comes back off of that, probably a little rushed, finishes really strong and does what he's doing. And then this was a microcosm of Adolis again, right? Gets hit right on the hand. I'm like, oh shit, did he break his hand? Like it looked ugly. He was in a lot of pain. It was a fast and then too. That later. Yeah. Goes deep, wins the game. Yeah. Um, it took until game one of the World Series for him to draw his first postseason walk. Yeah. So it's it's not like he's scattering the hits around a bunch of walks, and that's why the OPS is this high. He's hitting 340 with a 390 OBP this postseason. It is all from hits, and it's pretty much all from homers. He's got 20 hits, he's got one double and eight pumps. Eight pumps and 20 hits is ridiculous, but one double to go along with eight homers. This guy is fence hunting and he's clearing it constantly. Shout out to him. Shout out to the Rangers radio broadcast. After the walk off, they said Adolis Garcia is made for these moments. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I think he is. Um, A couple other takeaways. Yeah. No, I had one more thing that stood out to me. That's crazy is he's played 14 postseason games. Now he played 148 games in the regular season. So that gives us a perfect 162. And if you look at the 162 from the postseason and now the regular season, 47 home runs, 129 runs driven in. Yep. I, I mean, that is insane. I don't think people quite realize how dominant this guy was in the regular season, too. While playing gold glove caliber defense. Yep. He's a really good defender, and he's giving Unreal, them right. 47 and 130. Wow. A um, couple other takeaways for the Rangers, the three guys, I'm scared of all nine, but the three guys that I'm looking at, and it's like, I can't let them beat me. Seager, which they kind of made the case with the two early walks from Gallon, um, Adolis, big sense. And Evan Carter, who continues to hit the shit out of the ball. And, yeah. you know, like it's flexible. I think if if you heard me say that in the DS, you'd be like, come on, man, this is way too soon. Even in the CS, I'd have that thought in the back of my mind, like, come on, dude, you can't be serious about that. But we've seen enough of a sample to know that Semyon's a guy that you just have to tip your cap to if he inevitably or eventually gets hot because he hasn't been good for the first 15 games of this postseason. Yeah. But Evan Carter has been so good for the entirety of this month that I have to clump him in. It's Seager and Adolis on their own planets, but then it's Carter. And then I think it's yeah. everybody else. Here's the problem with that. You got Seager at two, you got Carter at three, and you got Adolis at four in the order. And look, I'm going after Carter for, for multiple reasons. One, he's not going to expand the zone. We've seen that already, right? He yeah. is, he's chased. No one has chased less than Evan Carter in this postseason. And I mean, that's just who he is. The thing is, again, Carter's a guy that I think if you execute your game plan a little bit, you can you can get him to, to roll over or whatever. I mean, especially when you work him away. Look at all of his hits in the postseason. He's looking for something to pull, and when he pulls it, he hits it freaking hard. But to your point, he's just waiting it out. He's battling, 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 then he gets that pitch that he can pull, and he, he hits it hard. That's uh, my thing. Like I feel like in a regular season, yes, over the course of a 30-game sample, you can attack his weaknesses. You can – get him to roll over pitches. But right now in the moment, and we got to look at it for the next five games, if we're lucky enough to get five more, like 
this guy isn't making mistakes offensively, it seems. So here's the thing. You walk Seager, which they should do a lot of the rest of the series. Carter's up. Adolis looms on deck. And Mitch Garver, by the way, who, you know, didn't do much in game one. He did walk twice, though, and then had the homer in, in, in game two. Waits on deck. And then you got, you know, Heim, Nathaniel Lowe, Josh Young. But most importantly, you got a Dolis there. Yeah. You, you're not putting on Carter. No, you, you don't have two to guys on for a Dolis. You got to yeah. go after him. And that's where the lineup protection is so important. And that's why I think, of course, the bottom of the order, those guys hitting will, will definitely be a major factor. But if Marcus Semyon gets going, man, yeah. this is terrorizing because you, you pretty much, you, you pretty much have no break. And in the front half, like, if Semyon's hitting, you're already on your heels and you're just entering the part of the lineup that we're talking about, you're the how terrified you are of. Yeah. It Semyon's a big X factor here. I think he can make it really hard on the D-backs if if he starts hitting a little bit better. Yeah. Um, takeaway, I have two Diamondbacks takeaways on the game one, and then we'll jump to game two real quick. My first is bullpen trio that we've kind of propped up on a pedestal for Arizona has been Thompson, Ginkle, at bullpen quartet. Thompson, Saul Frank, Ginkle, and Seawalt. We've kind of forgotten about Joe Maniply, and Maniply's inning in game one was nails. And we have to clump Maniply in with Saul Frank. No, I think he's lapped Saul Frank now. Like yeah. I, I, it's just fluid, and I, like, I'm with you. Saul Frank was great. And I mean, for, for what he's done as a – Yeah, kid, as a rookie, what the hell. Yeah, not even a rookie. He's like a, a – even uh, he's like a rookie rookie it's it's a yeah. through 26 year old iu kid yeah what yeah. the hell 10 10 appearances at the end of the season and you know he lost it command wise a little bit down the stretch uh you know of the last few games and uh you know man supply he was inconsistent during the year he battled some injuries battled some other stuff but i think with the way he looks right now man supply has kind of jumped over him but you bring up a great point this this is a huge development for them because you don't want your, your your main lefty to be a rookie that, you know, has not really been there, done that. And I know Mantiply is not the most experienced guy in the world either, but he's an all-star. He's, he's been there. He's been around a little bit more. And he, he yeah. he's, you know, I think got a little bit more going for him stuff wise when when he's on um, Mantiply being all-star Mantiply or something close to that, uh, I think is huge for this bullpen because I'll be honest, when you, when you saw it get to the latter innings, like when Miguel Castro came in, you knew it was over. I actually thought it might be over with when Kyle Nelson came in. Yeah, I thought it was over when Kyle Nelson came in. Like, I was like, okay, good night, Moon Rangers up one nothing. I'm going to Sal exactly. I'm going to Sal Frank over those guys. So yeah. now Sal Frank kind of goes to that role, which is okay. We're deep in a ball game. We got to go to somebody. I got way more confidence in him than you know Kyle Nelson and Miguel Castro. To me, those guys are like last case, like a worst case scenario. Yeah. Slade Chaconi, I did Chaconi make the post or make the World Series roster? He was on the CS roster. I think so, but I'm not positive. I I'm not say sure. Yes. That's like if if things go and hey, no indictment on Slade Chaconi, but he, I, in the situation, he is the if things go so south so quick, that's probably the guy. And the fact that you can turn to five instead of four is great. Yeah, I dude, I think I'd rather go to Slade Jaconi. I'd rather go to Luis Frias. I'd pretty much I think Miguel Castro is the last guy in this entire roster that I want to go to yeah. in any spot. I'd go to Frias. I'm cool with it. But it was also like, yeah, I mean Castro, it was 97 on the corner that Adoli took the I no, I know. It, I it's just it's something about it. like the slider just didn't look good. Like it was easy takes. And I get then, it. I don't know. I, I just it. had no confidence in Castro. He wasn't very good during the season. And and, and I mean the stuff is just not what it used to be, yeah. but on the other side, dude, John Gray out of the pen. Did so, you not sit there and think, wait, where has this guy been? I thought, wow, good for him. That's huge. And the Rangers, you know, they signed – Walker brings it up a lot on, on the Monday shows. Like, they signed six or seven guys. And they have their, you know, four that they're rolling with right now in Montgomery, in Ivaldi, in Scherzer, three or four. Uh, no, I mean, I guess Heaney and Dunning. But then you also have Martin Perez and John Gray. One of them needed to be good out of the bullpen. And Heaney, Heaney got flat out beat by Corbin Carroll in game two. And that was one of my game two takeaways. Dunning was really solid in his, you know, get out of a jam work. Yeah. Perez. 
ah, like my shoulders are a little tense. But John Gray in game one, he relaxes me when we see him in this three game stretch in Arizona. Yeah, that that I think is a big, big development for them, because yeah. this is a dude that we have only seen one other occasion in the postseason. Right. Now, I'm pretty sure it was garbage time in that Astro series, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. I, I mean, he went one in one and two thirds, one hit, no walks, four punchies. Yeah, I mean, th- this guy has good stuff. We know that, right? It's, it's been like, okay, how is he going to work as a starter? You know, can he turn lineups over a couple times? All those things. But out of the pen, just throwing fuzz, I think, and, and this is where Bochy's awesome because he's just got that feel, right? And mm-hmm. he's just been there and understands like, hey, this guy might have it right now. I'm really interested to see how Bochy handles Gray moving forward. Is it just like these random spots where, you know, you, you used other guys that you, you, you know, already were had a head on the totem pole? Maybe. But I wonder if John Gray's kind of jumped a couple spots here in terms of earning some trust from Bochy because that was an impressive performance in a really tough spot for a guy that has barely thrown this entire postseason. I, I was really impressed by that. Yeah, I was really impressed too. Um, and that's a new level, especially when we have that Rangers bullpen conversation. I didn't factor John Gray into that bullpen conversation. It was no. Spores, Chapman, Leclerc. You like it? Yeah, I like it. Everybody else? Mm, Houston, we have a problem. Now, if you add Gray to it, it's okay. Like that guy can give you two. Um, I hope that's not him moving forward because he was paid to be a starting pitcher. And I think he yeah. can be good as a starting pitcher. Um, but situationally, you always need one of those guys that's willing to swallow their pride and give them bullpen innings in the postseason. And for Texas to have that guy is awesome. Especially if, if we have, you know, I think the series, we're going to get more extra inning games, I think potentially at least one Possibly. more. And, you know, with the with the no runner on second rule in the postseason, which is great, obviously, we want to see, you know, we don't want any anything yeah. to undermine these games. I love it in the regular season. Yeah. Um, you, mean, you might have a 16, 17 inning game. And if that happens, having a guy out of the bullpen that can go two, three innings, maybe even four, uh, that's huge because the guys out of the bullpen that can be stretched out for the Rangers are not of this or excuse me, for the Diamondbacks are not of the same quality. Uh, it's, it, you know, I'm not going to trust some of these other guys that they may try to stretch out a little bit more. So I, I'm again, I, this is one of the more intriguing aspects of the rest of the series for me is how is John Gray used? Yeah. And it'll be fascinating to see. So this version of extra innings ball, like it's, you know, obviously it's even more high stress than regular season extra innings, but relatively speaking like there's less at stake i guess unless it's a gopher ball there's less at stake on a pitch by pitch basis when there's no automatic place runner at second base the thing that changes strategy wise um yes obviously it's harder to score but what do you need in an extra innings regular season game from your pitcher you need whiffs yeah whiffs require more pitches whiffs require chase whiffs require better stuff what do you need in an extra innings game in the postseason? You need a clean inning. And you've got guys like Merrill Kelly that can do that with three ground balls. Hell, he struck out like eight. So that's a move point. I can't point. wait to talk about that. Yeah, it's going to be crazy. But um, it's it's just a different ask in the postseason when you have a clean inning as opposed to guy at second, I need you to miss bats. Last yeah. game one takeaway was Corbin Carroll's just a freak game changer, man. Like, Oh, yeah. Scoring on that ground ball to first base, making every single fucking thing happen. This guy is, I'm floored by how comfortable he and Evan Carter look. But Carroll, with Seeger on the field, with Adolis on the field, Corbin Carroll is in the conversation for who's the best player on the field right now, <laughs> which yeah. is crazy. Yeah, it's it's absolutely absurd. Um, and and it, you're 100 right because if you take every facet of the game, of course it's it's Corey Seeger, but the way Carroll can impact it in so many different ways, he's definitely in that conversation. And that is patently absurd uh, because he's a rookie on this stage. I mean, th- that's why this world series is so fascinating to me. And, and I think baseball fans, and now I think people that end up throwing it on and, you know, cause they heard the game was crazy, you know, casual sports fans or whatever it may be, will end up being captivated by this series because there's so much young talent 
you're watching, you know, potential MVP candidates and and perennial all stars who are just starting their career, yeah. mixed with some really exciting and talented players and a, a Hall of Famer, you know, sprinkled in there. So there there's some really interesting dynamics of it that I think make this series way more fascinating than the names, you know, of the teams that that show, you know, uh, uh, in the box score or whatever you may say. That said, <laughs> I might have one last takeaway from this series. Austin Hedges got in that bat that obviously that was not planned to have had. So, yeah. you know, Josh H. Smith pinch runs for Jonah Heim. And then, you know, I don't think they were expecting the game to go as long as it did. No. And it turns out, you know, you need someone to catch uh, and that's going to be Austin Hedges. So comes back around to him in the lineup because the game kept going and it was a big spot too. And it's just really tough for, for anyone to be able to, to come through there. They end up winning anyways, but that, was that the one I don't want to pile on because Austin Hedges seems like it man. was. No, it was. Was that the worst at bat in World Series history? It, probably. Given the situation, probably. It was a three pitch punch out. He looked viciously <laughs> outclassed by Seawald, who just had a mammoth tank put on him by Corey Seeger. Um, yes, <laughs> he seems like a great guy. He seems super well respected. And I, I mean, he's got a chance to win a ring, but dude, like, beauty of baseball that guy is up with the chance to win the game for the rangers and he looks that outclassed yeah beauty of baseball he has a spot on a team that is extremely talented like you said could win the world series and they feel as though he provides value for them right they went out and got this guy for um, for international bonus pool money <laughs> they got him yeah. you know, it's that that to me is is what makes the sport so cool and i think he he obviously brings a lot to the table uh, beyond what we see on the field but man that was it was just like oh my gosh if austin hedges walks this off i genuinely wanted it so bad i wanted it so bad but after the first swing i was like all right you know i also want to go to outer space it's not going to happen for a little bit but yeah. um yeah that that was that was something else um but they won anyways which yes. is which is all that matters and uh also Evaldi, i thought pitched better than the than the line would suggest uh looked really sharp in the beginning and then you know we we, we saw I think it's kind of run into some trouble in the third and, and, and all that. But again, I, I will still trust Evaldi big time next time he gets an opportunity to throw. I was going to ask you, like, I, I actually had this written down, but then I was like, hmm, you know, I, I he could try and dunk on me and I'm not in the mood to get dunked on. But I said, did Evaldi throw well? And I just had that in there. And, and I thought that, you know, Obviously, you look at the box and you say, no, he didn't throw well, Jack, you moron. I thought he threw relatively well. There was a blip there, obviously, and Arizona capitalized on it. But that's what the Diamondbacks do. They they take little paper cuts at you and then they deliver a hook to the jaw that knocks you out. And I yeah. thought that's what game two was. But I ask you, do you think Eovaldi threw well? I thought he threw pretty well. Okay. Like, you know, eight punchies. There was some some weak contact, and then you know, I think once he started to run into trouble, it just kind of snowballed at the end. But I, I thought overall he threw pretty pretty well. Um, yeah. I thought it was just more of a testament to the Diamondbacks' offense, and also this was a day shorter's re- shorter rest than he's been accustomed to so far in this postseason. And you know, with a guy like him who's dealt with all these arm issues, you know, that could have played a factor. His velocity was right on par with what it normally is, but you know, that could have played a factor. Um, I think with normal rest next start, I think we'll get normal rest. I, I, will, I still have plenty of confidence in him and, and I give him the ball with, without much fear at all. Yeah. Game two went Arizona's way convincingly late. It was a tight game until the floodgates opened offensively. I want to save Merrill Kelly till the end. I just have a couple of takeaways before we get to Merrill Kelly that I want to dive into. An 18-game hitting streak for Cattell Marte is the longest in postseason history. Adolis has been amazing. <laughs> Corey Seager's been amazing. Corbin Carroll's been a game changer. But Cattell Marte has been inevitable this month. And he is the reason the Diamondbacks are in the World Series. He's going to be a huge reason why the Diamondbacks win the World Series if they do. And it's kind of cool that he's got a piece of history attached to him now. It, it really is amazing. Um, and it's cool that it ties back to years ago. And then he's just doing what he's doing insanely well now. And, you know, I didn't, I thought this would be where we saw it end. You know, he starts, what was it? 0 for four. And then gets this big hit here. And 
I mean, it was still a ball game when he yes. came through there. It wasn't like he just like poked a single through when it was nine one to extend the hitting streak. It was four to one, top of the eighth, three run lead. I'm not feeling safe against the Texas Rangers. Two outs, bases loaded, and he's on the on the other side of the plate. You know, he, he's much better from the left side. He's flipped around to the right side, and he comes through with a big single there uh, to kind of break it open. And and that's just been what Cattell Marte has been for this team at the top of the order. You know, all postseason and and really all season long. But yeah, I, I think it's kind of lost in the shuffle because his performances haven't been as flashy as mm-hmm. you know Adolis, and and that's just the nature of of Cattell's game, but he's gotten some crazy swings off in this postseason. I mean, getting to crazy tough pitches, his, his field of hits pretty impressive, but the speed, the power, he is so dynamic. Like the, the word dynamic gets used a lot. I use it you know, probably fairly often, but Cattell Marte is, is almost the epitome of, yeah. of what a dynamic player looks like. For sure. Um, I think maybe best version of Chris Taylor is like the best example of that yeah. because he can do everything defensively and he provides a ton of value offensively, but Marte is right there. But this was a 2-1 game through the sixth. I mean, the Diamondbacks got two in the seventh, three in the eighth, two in the ninth. Um, I wrote down, this is the best version of Arizona's offense. It's, you know, much like the paper cuts, it's jab, 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 and then the floodgates open. And they, they started to tear down like just by sheer wear and tear the rangers through the front six innings and then the seventh you saw it start to come to fruition and then it really piled on the eighth and ninth gabby moreno's homer there's something about the barrel tip to that screaming liner to left center that like is aesthetically beautiful he's special his hands, his hands work it just unbelievably well and you remember from yeah you know, the, the the top 100 days when we yeah. were talking about him as a prospect with the jays that was I think the only 70 hit tool that we had on our top 100 list, because yeah. again, it's just freaky how, how quick and short he is to the ball. But also as we've been pounding on the table to tell people is there's power in there too. He's short and quick, but there's power in there, which is just an enviable blend that, that you can have. And on top of that, just looks so comfortable. The takes are easy. Like this guy fully, fully figured it out in the second half of the season. And it's just, rolled into the postseason and not to mention how good he's been on the defensive side of things and so he's good. he's one of the best in the game at, at limiting you know stolen bases as well was the best you know per attempt it, it, it's just so fun watching him barrel baseballs and and it's it's been really awesome to see him you know perform on this stage and he kind of broke the, the floodgates as you said kind of just started things for them because i think maybe the most remarkable thing here and i know that you look at the rangers pitching in this ball game jack it's Montgomery, Heaney, Dunning, Stratton, Perez, those guys don't scream strikeouts. But in today's game, to play an entire ball game and only strike out two times as yeah. a team in the postseason. And again, Montgomery, like I know he doesn't rack up K's like with the best of them, but he gets plenty he of swings. Six. He can get seven and six innings of work. He got zero and six zero. innings of work. And and he was fine though. He got out, he, he hung in there, and then finally they got to him. But I think the most amazing thing about this game was that they only struck out twice. And that part of it is that is so hard to do in today's game. So when do you think they build the Tommy Pham statue? I mean, dude, if, if he faced lefties only, you know, for his entire career, he probably would have a statue. Uh, it, it, some seeing eye hits and then he smacked one, one eleven right back yeah. up the box. I mean, four for four. Cool. <laughs> uh, again, anytime there's a lefty in the lineup, I feel real good about Tommy Pham in the five spot or lefty on, you know, on the mound on the hill. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> there's other times where I feel real weird about Tommy Pham in the four or five spot. But when, when there's a lefty on the bump, I feel great. Yeah. Um, Arizona was six for 14 with runners in scoring position. Six for 14 is good. They, like really good. But the number that I want you to remember is 14. They had 14 at-bats with runners in scoring position. Seven of their nine runs came with two outs. How many at-bats with runners in scoring position did the Texas Rangers have in game two, Arm? Oh, I mean, with the way Kelly threw? Um, trying to think of anybody, if anything happened later in the game. I'm going to say none. Arizona had 14 at bats with runners in scoring position. Texas had one. They were 0 for 1. They left four men on. 
<laughs> they had no shot offensively against freaking Merrill Kelly. Seven innings, three hits, one run, nine Ks, and no walks. His only blip was a solo shot to Mitch Garver. I think the play that separates Texas being up 2-0 and and the series being tied 1-1 followed right after Garver. And we'll let's dive into that play before we actually like just throw flowers at Merrill Kelly. There was a ball that was bouncing down the first baseline that hit the front of the bag and gold glove level defender Christian Walker at first base spears it on a bare hand to make the play off the heels of a solo shot from Garver. If that tough luck single turns into a single or a double, I think that's when things can turn on a dime. But the fact that Walker made that play, that had to relax Kelly to a level that he may have not felt in the regular season. I thought that was the play of the game from Christian Walker. That's such a good point. And and I don't think people real like I, I honestly didn't even it didn't really register with me that that was the subsequent play because yeah. I think you're 100 percent right. You have all this momentum as a pitcher. You're rolling. You're rolling. You're rolling. Solo shot. You can snap back in when when you have a lead, especially and and, and again just keep keep going. But yeah, that seeing eye single after you know after a solo shot that can really slow you down. And I mean that that the amazing thing, and this is another reason why baseball is a great sport. Christian Walker isn't hit at all. No. <laughs> it's been really tough to watch, and I feel for him. And this guy has been laser focused, locked in at first base, making huge plays left and right. I mean. It, it has been remarkable. And to your point, we'll never be able to quantify that, right? You, there's, you can't see win, any win probability shift that ESPN or whatever gives you off of that singular play cannot capture the emotional aspect of it, the momentum aspect of it. There's so much more at hand here. I'm with you. I think that was one of the biggest moments and, and could end up being, and when we look back, one of the biggest moments of, of this World Series and, and definitely was you know, a key moment in that game. Aside from that, it was kind of all Merrill Kelly. This guy unlocked a, a level that we didn't see pre-KBO, post-KBO. Kelly's been good. Kelly is a blink and you're in the seventh inning type of pitcher. And this was a game where you you blinked and we were in the seventh inning. But, hey, like try not to blink because this was such a fun watch for Merrill Kelly. And this is, you know what it is? It felt very 2021 Lance Lynn where it was... I'm just going to slice and dice you to death because I'm better than you at this thing. And I know more than you about this thing. That's how Merrill Kelly threw in game two. And just with, with unbelievable execution. And the fascinating thing about Kelly is his fastball. You know, he's got a four seamer that'll throw up. And then he's got the sinker that he'll, he'll run you know, middle of the play and, and, and bottom of the, of, of the strike zone. And I tweeted out a sequence that specifically stood out to me against Leody Tavares. Kelly is really locked in right now. And also Moreno, you got to give him credit because he's calling pitches perfectly yeah. with Kelly right now where they're, they're just dancing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just amazing to see the the rapport they already have, but it was sinker about, you know, maybe just a hair below the middle of the zone on, on the outer half first strike. Then off of that, Kelly rips a change up that what's insane is it was only I think two to three miles per hour lower, you know, slower than you know, the, the, the sinker, which, you know, you want more separation than that from your changeup. But the reason why it works so well for Kelly and he snaps, it looks like it's starting at the same spot, drops down right below the strike zone. Both his sinker and his changeup horizontally break exactly the same, like the exact amount of, I think it was like 14, 13 and a half inches, whatever it is. It's the exact same, very similar plane. The difference is the changeup drops six more inches vertically. So it looks the same, the same, the same, the same, never mind. And that's what's amazing to me. So he's been abusing that with the sinker and then the changeup off of that, threw another one even lower, see ya, strike three. But the other thing is then he sneaks a four seam up, gets a Dolis Garcia to chase up there. Then he rips a slider down. I mean, it's a tunneling masterclass because everything's going in different directions yeah. and the cutter is setting up you know, a sinker to front door, Jonah Heim. Like there were all these different examples of just one pitch setting up another. But beyond that, it's the execution 
the command is unbelievable. We knew that, but the command execution, the sequencing, it's it's just been a blast to watch this entire postseason. Do you know like where he tends to sit on like stuff plus categories? Like stuff plus is always kind of a tough one for me because it, it is trying to encapsulate an entire arsenal when looking at pitch data in a vacuum. And it's it's hard to account for tunneling and things that you know Kelly does so well. Because, you know, to the high, it feels like stuff plus maybe in like the 70s or 80s, but execution plus feels like it's near 200 for the for exactly. A guy like I don't know. I don't look at stuff plus much. I, I don't either give it a little bit more love because, you know, a lot of people I respect in this industry, like definitely look at it and, and pay attention to it. But you know, it's for me, I could just, I just watch that. I, I look at the pitch shapes, see how it works and then see the swings that he's getting, you know, through these sequences and it's good stuff, right? <laughs> I, I, it's just one of those things that it's hard to, to really pinpoint exactly how stuff plus is going to be able to, you know, accommodate or, or, or recognize the way that every pitch out of his hand looks the same, the way that, you know, the, the way that he located a backdoor cutter sets up, you know, this sinker that just dives right down from that. You know, it, there's just so many different things that he did throughout that start that really stood out to me. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if that's going to show up uh, in, in the stuff plus always. There was the, the one sequence to Jonah Heim that was really impressive to me where he freezes him on a cutter uh, for a called strike. And think about it. So he's, he's a lefty, right? So yeah. you're going to have in this at bat, he's a lefty. You're going to have a cutter breaking towards you. And that's, he takes that first strike. He's like, okay, I'm, I'm calibrating. And thinking about that, he's thinking about something breaking towards him or, you know, maybe something, a change up working away from him off of that next pitch with two strikes, he goes with a sinker that starts inside and runs right back over the inside corner, freezes Heim. Heim doesn't even wait, wait for the, you know, strike three call. He just, you know, turns around and and walks to the dugout. Yeah. The, the, the way he's setting things up was just so satisfying and so fun to watch. Uh, but that was another sequence I just absolutely love. You have the cutter coming towards you, and then you have a sinker starting at you that runs back over the inside part of the plate. Yeah. I mean, he was just executing to perfection. Um, we are going to hop into the overreaction or not and preview in a moment, but I'm kind of in on this stuff plus thing because on fan graphs, there were 44 qualified starters this year. Merrill Kelly out of 44 was 38th in stuff plus. He was eighth in location plus. Okay. So location plus good stuff. Plus also good. And Merrill Kelly, it, it checks out. It confirms my thoughts. If something confirms my thoughts, it's good. Regardless of outlet. That's if it furthers my agenda, I think <laughs> something is really. Then we love it. Well, yes. It, and here's the thing, dude, it's small sample size with the playoffs, right? We have four starts to work with, with Kelly. And he had the one where a couple long ball, three long balls ended up, making the start look worse than it was all of the other pitches were, were pretty damn good. Yeah. His sinker. He hasn't, I don't think he's gotten a whiff in the zone on the sinker the entire postseason, And I'm pretty sure just whiffs period. I think he's gotten two or, or, or four, but opponents have one hit. <laughs> it's it's one home run on Sometimes the sinker. This shit and that's just it. Works. Sometimes and, it works. <laughs> and the, the home run, by the way, was Mitch Garver and Anybody listening to the podcast right now, go look back at the Mitch Garver home run. Go look at where that pitch was. Yeah. It was a ball, both down and inside. Garver just absolutely dropped the head on it. And funny enough, what does Kelly do next at bat? Everything is cutter, slider away, retires Mitch Garver very quickly. Yeah. So the way he was adjusting too, and again, that's Moreno as well. Pitch calling was phenomenal. But yeah, the, the one home run he's given up on the sinker all postseason – was legitimately a ball both down and inside. So, I mean, it's been it's been fun to watch on the postseason so far. By the way, opponents are hitting a buck forty five uh, wow. against Merrill Kelly. So, take I mean, that stuff plus. Yeah, thirty one percent strikeout rate too. We're gonna do overreactions and then preview. But okay, let's do overreactions or not. You have four of them. Uh, simple explanation is you're gonna throw four takes out there. And I'm just going to deem it an overreaction or not. Yes. And I don't necessarily believe these. Okay. Some of them I might, some of them I might not. And I also want to know if you think I believe this or not. So okay. <laughs> that'll be the the nice little wrinkle into Perfect. this. But first one, we actually kind of teased, which is funny enough. And 
uh, probably the least dramatic one in terms of, of what we're going to talk about, but Christian Walker is the best defensive first baseman in baseball. Um, yeah, I think it's not an overreaction because he's been there metrically. I think he's going to be a gold glove candidate. He has been for now, I think a couple of years, he's been a gold glove finalist and I think he will be for two more years. So I don't think it's an overreaction. I think it's pretty valid. And I think you believe it. Second to only Carlos Santana and defensive run saved. But dude, if we, we need like picks plus because yeah. I, I, I don't know if that's baked into some of the, the I need bare hand grabs plus that's what yeah, I that need. one too. But I don't know if we have it baked into the defensive analytics um, in terms of, of scoops and things like that. But I think it's one of the most important things that you can do as a first baseman. You're not only saving potentially an extra 90 feet, you're also stealing outs on yes. throws that you know were bad throws. I, I think that's something that really needs to be factored in here more. And, and Christian Walker might be the best at picks I've ever seen. Also, sp- like splits at first and all of that crazy stuff. Yeah, I believe it. And I think he is the best defensive first baseman in baseball. And, and the reason why I'm doing this overreaction thing is postseason, you know, it's a big stage. It's one of those situations where we get very excited mm-hmm. and we can tend to shift our perspective on players because of what they do in the postseason, which is normal. And, and, you know, I think it's important to say, okay, this guy performs in the postseason, but I think sometimes like, there's going to be some players here that, that based on how they performed in the postseason, we're going to have elevated expectations for in the regular yep. season. And that's where the overreaction sometimes from the postseason can be overreactions. So let's that's call, why I have some of these conversations. Let's call it the Pena effect. This is the Jeremy Pena effect. The Jeremy Pena you. effect. Exactly. I think that's a, a great thing uh, uh, to tab it as. Um, I have two others off the dome that I wanted to, I, I think you, I know what you're going to say, um, but real quick, because I, I wanted to just make sure this wasn't one that I had ready to go, Yeah. but that Merrill Kelly start was the best postseason start of this October. Overreaction. Um, Brandon fought game three against the Phillies in Arizona down 2-0 was the best start that we've had in the postseason because Kelly has proven success. Merrill Kelly by was like ERA, even by reliability, we knew that he was the clear cut number two behind Gallon's number one. Fott stunk in the regular season. And the fact that Fott did what he did in game three in Arizona with their backs against the wall, Phillies just took the first two in that CS. I think that Fott's performance in game three of the CS was the best performance that we've had. So I will say overreaction. Um, I think you may believe it, though. What about Wheeler's? Wheeler had some performance. Yeah, shit. Okay, so you, I guess you don't believe it either. <laughs> I don't. But I, I wanted it. I wanted to believe it so bad because of how incredible the the performance was. Yeah, I think you can make the case. I, I would love. I'd have to go like apples to apples, and that's why I didn't initially plan to bring that one in here. But I wanted to discuss it because how long we talked about Kelly's start and some of the details. I, I think that the just pure dominance and overpowering nature of of Wheeler starts make them you know outwardly seem more dominant. But it's like, yeah, you had the one solo shot but you mentioned only one opportunity with runners in scoring position. Like that's, that's pretty insane. No walks, nine K's, a lot of weak contact. I think it's, it's close, but you know, might not quite, quite be there. Yeah. Next one. Evan Carter is the rookie of the year favorite next year. Um, in the American league. Yeah. In the American league. Let me pull up the just baseball top 100 to make sure I'm not <laughs> missing anybody right now. I, I'll I, give you, yeah, give me, give me some reasoning and I'm going to have a firm answer for you in about 30 well, seconds. So this is a classic example though. I mean, this guy, what he's doing in the postseason is remarkable. Um, he was a top 10 prospect still for us. So if, you know, it's, it's not like he wouldn't be one of the favorites, but clear cut American league favorite is, you know, that's an interesting situation to be in because there's some guys that I think are a little bit more like just explosive. Uh, I think fill up this, the stat sheet a little bit more over 162. Yeah. But again, you have an Evan Carter here. Who's just like, I'm flappable. He doesn't get affected by the moment. He 
is getting unbelievable, gaining unbelievable experience here and gaining an unbelievable amount of confidence. So based on that, I think he's probably going to be the most popular or one of the most popular bets. Uh, and we'll see what the odds are from BetMGM when that time comes around. Yeah. But I'm just thinking about it from pure production standpoint over, over 162. Should he be the favorite? I don't know, because there's a mental side of being a rookie and there's the just pure ability side. of being Yes. A so I don't think you believe it. And I am going to say overreaction because I just took a glance. It's still live at just baseball.com, just baseball's top 100 prospects. And I realized, oh, shit. Yeah. Junior Caminero gets a full season in the big league. So Caminero should be the odds on favorite for rookie of the year. But there are some other guys that jump out to me, too, I think. Jason Dominguez across a full season, he yep. can do some of the counting numbers that Carter can't do. Like Dominguez can steal 50 bases next year. Yep. Carter can't. Carter can steal 20. Dominguez can steal 50. Carter can hit 30. So can the Martian. Um, so it's, I, I think that there are enough guys that can put together gaudy numbers before I think Carter puts together gaudy numbers. Another guy to sneaky watch out for if Kobe Mayo figures out a way to sneak into the Orioles lineup, that guy can go bombs away for 162. Oh yeah. I love that you said that because he's going to hit like seventh and get a lot mm -hmm. to hit mm -hmm. and hit bombs. And we're going to get the, who the hell is Kobe Mayo from so many people when he has 30 home runs potentially. Yeah. yeah just know, just know we knew he's special. <laughs> I go check out that interview on the call up. I, I love that dude. He's a yeah. great guy and really, really smart hitter. Next one. Gerardo Perdomo is an above average big league shortstop moving forward. Uh, uh, overreaction. You don't believe it. Perdomo has been huge in huge spots for Arizona, but there's a reason he's hitting ninth for a team that was the last team in. Like record wise, was the worst wild card team we had this year. Perdomo was an all star, but so was Orlando Arcia. Like the best shortstops in the National League were just kind of not really a thing this year. Um, I think Perdomo is a really good defender. Um, I think Perdomo can supply power in spurts, but we really didn't see much pop this year from Geraldo Perdomo. So much of his value offensively needs to come from batting average. And, and I think that there's too much that can go wrong to consider Perdomo an everyday shortstop option. Yeah, I, I've i always been a skeptic since he was a prospect. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've been really impressed with what he's doing in the postseason. He's also had some insane batted ball luck and in, in, in the nine spot, right? He's getting a lot to hit. And no one wants to put him on to get to Cattell, Corbin, Moreno, et cetera. But you also can't take away what he's done. I mean, the defense no. is unbelievable. I think he's really solidified himself as a an important utility piece that is going to see a lot of action. But, you know, I think it would be silly to um, be giving him shortstop reps over like a Jordan Waller uh, consistently. You, next you know, year. It, but th this is a guy that I think a lot of people are like probably shifting yeah. their perspective on a little bit. And I am even in some sense, because after when he was an all star because of that first month, I'm like, okay, I know nothing about baseball because I was, I couldn't have been more, more yeah. out on this guy as a big league regular shortstop. Right. And then he had you know, the, the rest of the season that he had where he was, I think one of the worst qualified hitters in major league baseball the rest of the way. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, but he's still valuable defensively and, you know, can get hot and, you know, like Jorge Mateo put it together with, with, with nice stretches and the defense, yeah. the speed, it all plays. But then he's doing this in the postseason where I'm like, this is just such a, safe player to have that you know is always going to get the bunt down that you know is going to make the play that you, you know is going to give you a grinded out at bat yeah. and i think that's a valuable player um but i don't think that's an above average big league shortstop in today's game given what the shortstop position has become which is a very offensive driven position at the end of the day and there's a reason why jeremy Pena is not a top 50 he's probably not a top 15 shortstop yeah. in the I, I have to list them all out in front of me he's definitely not a top 10 yeah, and it, that's a guy who picks it with the best of them. But and and I'm taking offense. Pena over Perdomo eight days a week. Oh, I'm taking Pena for sure. But the point being, like, those are guys that don't hit enough, and yeah. that's a, it's just become such an offensive driven position. I mean, look at what right. Seager got. He's turned into an unbelievable defender, uh, or at least a really good one. But there was a lot of questions about the defense. No one gave yeah. a shit. <laughs> Give him ten years. Who cares? You no, know, he got and, paid and for the bad, and Ahmed got DFA'd, and he was paid for the glove.
Yeah, like, and, and that glove ends up being terrible. Right. Um, or, or sorry, Ahmed, you said. I, I was Ahmed. thinking Ahmed is Ariel for some reason. Oh, no, no, that. no. But no, that's another perfect example. The bat, or the glove did slow down, but, you know, it, it was still, it was still really good. Yeah. Last one for you. Mm-hmm. I was going to say Corbin Carroll is going to win MVP, can win MVPs, but like not an overreaction. That's valid. Yes. Um, there's two, and I want to pick one. Okay. Let me think here. Because another one that I was going to mention, Josh Young will make all like several all star. I think he will. Not an overreaction. Yeah. Unreal at third base. Also, did I tell you how Thomas found it or did I tell you how Thomas found it? Yeah, dude. I mean, I thought he found it when he was like, five years old like so yeah i know i know you've always been in on him but like he was been lost with the swing like there were some moves that weren't there and we talked about it a couple episodes ago like three in the morning i was watching open like open side swings and i was like oh my gosh he's got it no (laughs) he's he's great he's he's an everyday outfielder now like he's he's taken the he's making he's made the jump to everyday outfielder instead of fourth outfielder which we were worried he was kind of dropping to at certain points this season gabriel moreno is a top Gabriel Moreno is a top three catcher in the game. Okay. Um, okay. 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 Adley. Sure. Real, Real Mito. And. Sure. I, I'm going to. Yeah, sure. And. Um, Gabby. You're He's... Sean Murphy. No, I'm Will taking Smith. Moreno over Sean Murphy. Will Smith? Oh. Will Smith hits so much. <laughs> he's he's so good with the stick, and he's gotten better year by year defensively. Okay, I'm going to say give he's you on the one. outside looking in. Yeah. Because Jonah Heim. I mean, Jonah Heim, 4-4 war. Um, Gabriel Moreno is the best catcher in this series. Yeah. That's not an overreaction. I don't think so. I I think it's a conversation that can be had. Moreno had a one nine war, ninety nine games was hurt. Obviously, finished really strong. Uh, Jonah Heim played one hundred twenty games, switch hitting catcher, sixteen home runs, uh, one Jonah, of the best defenders, four four war. I love Heim. I think Heim is awesome. Heim is reliable, but Jonah Heim can't get on stretches like this. No, and uh, no one limits the run game in, in a game now that where it's become increasingly important. That's the thing, the man. Like. Does. I'm taking him over Rio Muto, by the way, next year. Um, it, it's hard because there's so much precedent with JT and there's none with Moreno. Here it is. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And that's why I don't think it's over. So I'm I'm going, I'm I'm that was the one I just kind of wanted to plug in. I think he is a top five catcher going into next year. I'll say top five. Yeah. Yeah, and that's not an overreaction. I'm taking over Cal Rally. I'm taking him over, you know, some of the other guys that were in the in the top five. I'm taking him over Jonah High moving into next year. I'm taking, and, and that's the one like where I think it's an acceptable like role with what we've seen in the postseason because we saw it also over the final forty games of the regular season too. Yeah, I think three is an overreaction. I don't think five is fair. And, and then actually one more quick one: Brandon Fott will be a top thirty. Five pitcher next year, <laughs> top forty pitcher. Give me top. Brandon Fott will be a top forty pitcher next year. We're doing the hot one hundred. Um, man, might be a little bit of an overreaction. Ah, I don't know. There's there's something about like what good postseason performances can do for a pitcher's morale going into the next year. Like he's gonna be walking around like I'm the fucking man <laughs> this off season, and and that might be a good thing. Um. And I've heard nothing but great things about Fod. I've heard down to earth guy. I think it might be a little bit of an overreaction because he was so bad at points in the regular season. Like I, yep. I don't know why. Don't ask me for a rhyme or reason, but he was batting practice at points in the regular season. And I have to see what the middle looks like because we've seen the tenth percentile and the ninetieth percentile or the ninety fifth percentile for Fod. I got to see what fifty looks like. So I don't think it's an overreaction okay. um, and I'm going to write a piece on that coming up very okay. soon uh, about everything that changed in his arsenal and, and all that good stuff. Uh, and then by the way, Merrill Kelly, this isn't like a, is this an overreaction or underreaction I, or whatever? <laughs> I, I, this is really interesting. 
I think Merrill Kelly may have the best contract of any pitcher in baseball. I don't think, I don't think that you can say that that's an overreaction. Like, I don't even know if that's like, you can apply that to this segment that I've already stretched out way too long, but Merrill Kelly makes eight next year and he's got a club option for seven the year after that. Yeah. Give me a pitcher. That's a better bargain. You could say Sandy uh, Alcantara, but after the year he had now TJ, like he's, he's no, um, because the number is so low, Freddie Peralta. Oh yeah. What's Peralta's Peralta made two, two, five in 2022. He made three and a half this year. He makes five and a half next year. And then he's got club options for eight in 25 and 26 his age 29 yeah, yeah. and 30 season. So right. I think that is, but Kelly is not far behind. Yeah. You got me on the overreaction then I guess it technically is. There we um, go. But yeah, that said, I wanted to just like, is I think sometimes listeners like they're not as nerdy about the contract situations as, is you know, people like us and yeah. um, Merrill Kelly sneaky 35 because of you know, going to, pitch in the KBO and all that good stuff. So he was under team control still for way longer and, you know, got this deal and it was worth it for him to be able to, you know, secure her to generational wealth, even at, at being a bargain. Yeah. And he's making a lot of money this postseason too and incentives and all that good stuff. But I just love, I love when you can identify like, whoa, that's a bargain or like, whoa, that's a really cool uh, situation that the D-backs have. And it's a big reason why I think they're going to spend next year. Uh, that, you know, they've got Fott, who's very cheap. They've got yep. Gallon under control. They've got Kelly, you know, basically under control and super cheap. Moreno under control. Thomas under control. Carroll is already locked up and very cheap. Uh, it, this whole team is really cheap. I, they were in on Bogarts, uh, allegedly, in the offseason, you know, before. I, I, I think that we're going to see the, the D-backs be players in free agency. I hope so. Yoshinobu Yamamoto, you are an Arizona Diamondback. Oh yeah. Please check out that article I wrote. I really enjoyed putting that together. I put down really an good. entire, like literally broke down his entire arsenal. Um, I know people were very thirsty for pitch data on Yamamoto. Mm -hmm. We were able to secure some of that, got that information, got video. I break it all down on why I think he is worth more than a hundred million dollars without a doubt. Yep. Quickly game three tonight, Scherzer and Brandon fought. Who wins? Why? It's in Arizona. It's at 803 tonight. I love that they are very specific with, hey, it's an 803 first pitch. It was a 607 first pitch in the DS. Like, I like that instead of 05 and it turns into 08. 803. <sighs> I think Fott has some weird fucking magic going on. And I think that Fott twirls another gem and Arizona wins game three. You know what? It's so wild that we're imagine at, at the beginning of the season, or maybe a month in, Fott's getting teed off on. Max Scherzer's, I don't even remember what he was doing a month in. Obliquing. Uh, obliquing, but still, it's Max Scherzer. Imagine yeah. I tell you, you know, in the World Series, Max Scherzer is going to face Brandon Fott, that guy with the 10 ERA. Uh, and we're going to look at it as a potential advantage for the Diamondbacks. This sport's wild. Stupid. I I am really unsure because a big reason why Fod is having more success has been the, the added carry on the fastball. The other part of it is that his sweeper has changed, and that's something I'm really – again, we're going to break down like from a data perspective. Yeah. It's really interesting how the sweeper has changed. Um, it, it, for the better, obviously, from a release point, from a extension, shape, all that. But the Rangers hit ride. We saw that big time with uh, that Javier matchup. And the Rangers, as you know, our one of our editors, Leo Morgenstern, laid out. Mm -hmm. It didn't end up working out that that well uh, in certain spots, but it, they they crushed sliders. So it's interesting. It's a tough matchup for Fox. He's been magical, but on the other side, how much do you trust Max Scherzer? I feel like I've incrementally gained some confidence in Scherzer each start. And I know he hasn't turned in gems, but short leash bullpens rested because the last game was an absolute bloodbath by the end. And they didn't really go to any of their main guys. I I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. How do you think Scherzer throws? I think is the big question. 
I think it's a, a really hmm, short leash, I'd say, especially because Gray and Martin Perez went game one. I don't think Bochi wants to turn to Martin Perez. No. If the score gives him an opportunity to do so, he will. But I think you can have some confidence in Gray, especially he gave him what? Three innings? When? No, he, he, he gave him a inning and two thirds. Inning and two thirds. Okay. So, yeah, I, I think that Scherzer doesn't make it out of the fifth. I think he gets into the fifth. I'll call it four and a third for Scherzer. And then it's up to the bullpen to piece it together. And I don't think Chapman's come in the game yet. Has Spores thrown? Did Spores Spor- throw in game one? I don't think Spores threw in game one. Am I am I forgetting something? Spores and Chapman. Spores, spores and Chapman. Spores and throw. Yeah, so they've got Spores available. Chapman. LeClerc <laughs> threw, tw- threw two innings, but he only threw 26 pitches and didn't throw in game two. That's two days rest. Yeah. I, Gray, I think you've Gray's got available. a – Yeah. You, you've got a bullpen that is all systems go. I all think that Scherzer go. throws – four gets into trouble in the fifth and he's lifted if that i mean i think they're going to handle it very similarly to how we saw it handled in his his last outing um and he was kind of surprised to come out but you know that's what they did i i'm gonna go rangers in this one um and i know i've been gassing up fought and i think he still turns into a decent start but i do think that they ultimately get to him and the difference is they're probably not going to let fought turn the lineup over a second time you know so for them to see him a third time I just imagine that they're still going to be somewhat short with the leash. Yeah. And I just don't, I don't love if it turns into a bullpen game. I know that the D backs have, you know, some of their guys rested as well, uh, relatively speaking, but Ginkle threw 28 pitches in game one. Like that was a grind for, for Ginkle. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had 22 from Seawald too. I know they got a couple days to rest, but Ginkle has been used a lot. And yeah, it, it it's still even with a couple of days to rest, thirty pitches almost. Uh, I mean, and they were high effort, high stress pitches. Yeah. I think it's a bullpen battle. Uh, you know, after the fifth, fourth or fifth, and I think the Rangers can kind of outlast them in that in that capacity. Yep, we will find out tonight. Aram, thank you, man. Enjoy, uh, enjoy Scottsdale. Go out on a Sunday night. I, no thanks. What is Tyson yeah. Badgent doing tonight? Tyson Bagent, my Bears quarterback. I don't know what he's doing tonight. Oh, I don't know, but I I took the Bears uh, plus whatever, so um, I hope they're doing all right. I saw it was Uh, nine and a half. I'm a little worried, but we shall see. Um, Arm, you are the man. Any link you need is in the episode description, including the merch action, and it's officially JB hoodie season. I'm wearing a hoodie indoors. I wasn't doing that before like two weeks ago, and now I'm a hoodie indoors guy for the next six months. Join us on that wave. Um... Check out our friends at Outlier. I have had a blast putting together those uh, playoff previews using Outlier, and it is like a cheat sheet. It's amazing. So we will talk to you guys tomorrow.